Hello. Uh, welcome to my presentation, Dungeons, Dragons, and Distillations, uh, addressing the unique challenges of narrative game design in STEM classrooms. Um, just super quick, uh, could I get a little hands up if I for my STEM people, which might change what I do later? Okay, excellent, perfect, good representation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about narrative games and how to use them in a STEM classroom. Um, so just for purposes of narrative games, I'm talking about storytelling, the classic example, Dungeons and Dragons. If you've played that before, yes, hopefully use a little bit of that lingo, not a ton. Uh, but basically, you can be a player in a, in a world and explore that world and make decisions and so on and so forth. Um, so how can we bring some of those elements into the STEM classroom? Uh, so just very briefly, a little bit about me. Um, I have a chemistry background for my undergraduate degree. Uh, there's a picture of my, my little family with my husky, Mika, my husband. Um, I went through the two summers program, so representing the two summers program a little bit here at UConn in educational technology, uh, not this past year, but the year before. Um, I taught for seven years. The first two years were, uh, was in a very small school in Fairbank, Iowa. There was two science teachers. I was the first female science teacher the school had ever had. Um, so that, that was an experience. And then I taught at Staples High School for the last five years where we have nine physics teachers, just physics. So it's a broad range there. Um, I've taught a lot of uh, different science stuff. Um, so. Physics and programming is mainly what I'm doing right now, uh, but I've taught you know, astronomy courses, environmental science, forensic science, some integrated science, so basically any science that they throw at me, and they're, I'm kind of jack of all trades for sciences. Um, and I am starting, very excited, the EdTech PhD program this fall um, to sort of expand some on some of the work that I've been doing in my classroom. Okay. Uh, so why do we want to do narrative games to begin with? What is the benefit of, of doing a narrative type game? Um, it's rooted a little bit with learning theory, just a little tiny bit of learning theory and situated cognition, um, where basically the activity that the person is doing um, cannot be separated from the learning experience itself, right? So uh, <clears throat> depending on what activity you're doing, what the person is able to transfer and take away will be completely different. Um, so if we can in increase uh, student agency and engagement through a narrative game, um, as we're sort of learning, they might be able to take more away from the experience and be able to transfer it to other aspects of their lives and all of that wonderful stuff. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I have two examples of games uh, that were created in the Two Summers program in uh, Steve Sloda's course. Uh, the first one that I'm going to show you is uh, a fellow student, Joe, um, who is a middle school science uh, social studies teacher. And he wanted to create a narrative game on the Irish potato famine. Um, and the genre that he's using is historical fiction. Uh, we used a platform called Twine to build these games out. Um, which, if you're not familiar with, is a very cool um, little platform that you can use. Little example here, um, where basically you can program out a story with branching pathways, and people can pick uh, sort of like a choose your own adventure type of story. Um, you don't need any programming experience to use Twine, which is excellent. But if you do have a little bit of programming experience, you can include variables and CSS, JavaScript um, as needed, which is pretty cool. So here's the first example. This is Joe's example. I know it's a little bit small here. Let me see if I can zoom in. There we go. <clears throat> uh, and I apologize. I'm going to be doing a little bit of reading for you, uh, but that's OK. So. The year is 1850. A barrage of salty air and surf laps upon the Irish coastline. It is breakfast time, or as of late, the hour when you recall the days of eggs, potatoes, and porridge each morning. It has certainly been a while. So now the player gets to select what they would like to do. Uh, what do you want to do? What should we do? Let's visit the chicken coop. Excellent. OK, so we visit the chicken coop. The last hen lifts up her head slowly as you enter. 
It looks like it requires great effort on her part. We'll peer into the nest. A single egg hides among the straw. Not that long ago, you'd collect three or four each morning. You pocket the egg and glance back at the skinny and forlorn hen your neighbor had asked to trade for her last autumn. Is it too late to strike a deal? Your stomach growls with an all too familiar force. It has been weeks since you've had any meat. What should we do? Keep the hen. That's, yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> Three days pass, you check on the hen, where she once roosted as a cluster of blood-stained feather and a single cracked egg. It appears a fox has come in and eaten your last meal. You head down to scavenge by the waters where the churning of the sea reminds you of your own insatiable hunger. Ooh, that's the end of this story. Um, as it turns out, no matter what you pick, you have a terrible ending uh, for all of these, just so you are aware. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to just hold this in your mind for a second. We're going to talk about it shortly. And uh, we're going to compare it to the game that I created uh, for the same project. Uh, so my example was built for high school physics. The topic is kinematics, which is the science of motion. Uh, I decided to go with a horror genre. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what this looks like. Oh, maybe. I don't care that I'm sharing. Get out of the way. Ooh. Trying to pop up there. Okay. <clears throat> Zoom in a little. Oops. You remember the stench of its breath. The thought sends a shiver down your spine and urges you forward. The trees close in around you. Fog veils the light from the moon, obscuring your path forward. You must escape. The stillness of the night is broken by the sound of turbulent water. This is the turbulent water. A cold black river crosses your path. You see only two options. Should we jump or swim? You want to jump? OK. The swift serpentine river is flowing across your path. You estimate the water is five meters across. You back from the edge and take a running jump. If you leap at 12 meters per second and at an angle of 35 degrees, how long will it take you to cross the river? Uh, I did. I did code in, yeah, it's the, the, this is the horror, the doing the math part, is that the joke? Uh, so for testing purposes, I included the answer. Um, it is a really neat program because you can, I, I, uh, the numbers that we have are variables, so every time they're randomized and you get different problems, which is, which is cool. It was an excellent program, um, and I was able to code it in uh, so that, you know, let's make it across the river this time. Oh, my num lock's on, 0 0.508. You have to get it correct within, like, I think, 2%. Oops. <clears throat> and with a mighty leap, you make it across. We did it. You hear a disquieting rustling in the bush on the opposite shore. Too big to be natural wildlife. You're sure it must be on your trail. You push onward, treading carefully through the unfamiliar terrain until you nearly stumble into a precipitous ravine. The chasm seems too far to jump across. You notice a vine that you might use to swing across. There's a dead tree on the ground you could push across and clamber over. I like the vine. See the vine? <clears throat> the tangled, ragged vine doesn't look very sturdy. It might only handle about 659 newtons of tension before snapping. The vine seems to be eight meters long. Uh, basically, this is a vertical circular motion problem, right? That obviously uh, you would want to calculate before uh, going across. So let's, uh, if I overestimate, and then let's say uh, we'll do seven here. You swing too quickly and the vine breaks with a snap. You tumble to the bottom of the ravine, the underbrush, and okay, so you go on and go for like, this is the, the summary here. Uh, but you go through, I think there's three sort of obstacles that you have to go through. And if you make it correctly throughout, then you, you know, make it to safety. Um, if you uh, get something wrong, you have to go back up to the, uh, hi, <laughs> back up uh, to the obstacle and try again. You have basically three tries on each obstacle before you're found by it, right? Okay, uh, so while it was a cool program and an awesome project, um, I'm guessing some of you might already know <laughs> what I'm gonna talk about here. 
Um, but what were some of the differences that you noticed between the, the two styles of two, two games here that, that we had created? The math, right? Well, and, and, and this is what I want to talk about. I'm, I'm going to feel free to say, okay, basically, what is wrong with my game? What, what, what is not excellent about this game that I created? Some of the one was more like slightly more immersive and then you're out. Well, it was a lovely game. <laughs> Very well made. It, it definitely seemed like there was a story part and then there was like, we're going to do some work now, then we'll get some story, then we'll get some work. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, that completely got to the math parts, you end up with a space between player act and just jumping across a river. <laughs> right. Exactly. It does not make a whole lot of sense. Um, if you're trying to build a narrative game, you want to be a part of that game. You want to uh, make decisions for your character that actually make sense. So nobody is going to be running from a horror monster uh, and doing circular motion calculations about whether or not they're going to make it across on a vine. Like, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? So this is the, the crux of the problem, right? <clears throat> when you have a humanities type of game that you want to build into a, a narrative style game, um, I, I find that it, it maps a lot better, uh, or at least easier <laughs> than in the science realm. Um, the problem solving really pulls the audience out of the narrative. I completely agree with what you said. Um, but the problem is, uh, as a science teacher, I want to make a game that you know uses science. Like I. I, uh, we, we get a little bit of hand waving in the program, us STEM people, when we're asked to design a narrative game of like, <laughs> yeah, we get a little bit of hand waving of like, oh, just, you know, do something adjacent to your topic. Like, don't do anything with formulas because that pulls you out of the game and all that stuff. But I really wanted to try to, you know, mesh it together. So it brought me back to sort of thinking about uh, how I could really immerse the content and the narrative, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, also, <laughs> I am not much of a creative writer. Uh, that is not my strong suit. Uh, when I play Dungeons and Dragons, I'm the person that, you know, makes a spreadsheet for my character, and I'm going to min-max my stats, and we'll role play a little bit. You know, we'll do our best, but uh, that is more my comfort level is the math. Enjoy the math. Um, so not saying all STEM folks are out of their comfort zone with creative writing, but I sometimes feel that way. <clears throat> so um, what I want to talk about now is a little bit about uh, one of the units that I go through with my physics students and how I mapped a more narrative experience to that unit. So the unit that I'm going to talk about is all about electrostatics, um, which if you are unfamiliar, um, is static electricity, right? rubbing the balloon on your hair and all that jazz. Um, and so the ND lab that we usually do uh, with my high school physics students is all about an inkjet printer. And if you're unfamiliar with an inkjet printer, basically uh, ink is charged um, and it goes through um, a uniform electric field. And that electric field will push the ink droplet um, and it'll angle it in a certain way so that it hits the page in the exact right spot. That's how the basics of ink inkjet printers work, which if you aren't excited by that, that's okay because high school students generally aren't either. Um, so uh, we do have a simulation that kind of goes with it just to model. Why does this go away? Can I move it? What is control T? No. Uh, there. Okay. Uh, so this is the simulation that we would normally use where you can run it. Here's your charged particle and it gets deflected by the plate. This wouldn't actually make it out. You know, the students can modify the strength of the electric field, um, the distance between the plates, all that jazz. One of the problems that I found with this for um, my physics B students, which are the like, intro level um, physics students, is the, the angle. Um, is a little bit challenging for them. Usually we would like to run with a parallel field. Um, it really matters rather than a perpendicular field. Um, so it's not like a great simulation, like it's a good simulation, but it's not 
exactly what I would love and want in a simulation, but it works. Okay. So here is the, the sort of transition. Okay. Inkjet printer. Splatoon. Ooh. Have you heard of Splatoon before? Familiar a little bit. Um, I basically only know Splatoon through like, uh, what's the Super Smash Brothers, right? That's where I was introduced to it. So I, don't, I didn't have a ton of familiarity with Splatoon, but I did know they have ink guns, right? Um, so I, I started thinking about how these ink splatter guns could potentially work similar to an inkjet printer, right? And the idea kind of took off from there. Um, as it turns out, there is actually a very rich, established Splatoon lore. Very <laughs> goes back hundreds of years. It's a fascinating history. I'm not going to go into it a ton, but there's a lot to draw upon. Um, and the basics of what you need to know for this presentation, um, power in the world of Splatoon is derived from something called zap fish, which are basically these floating little fish that hold electric charge, right? That is canon. Um, and basically what I want, what was sort of pictured was that students would basically take on the role of scientists um, that would work in the Splatoon universe and were basically um, hired technically frozen in time and then like, reanimated into the Splatoon world because it is actually on Earth. It's a fascinating history. Anyway, uh, but the students will take on the role of scientists and they're going to help um, the, the habitants, uh, inhabitants of the Splatoon universe uh, redesign some of their technologies to better their Splatoon gun um, <clears throat> so that, you know, the, the Inklings, when they're fighting with the Octarians, you know, can have the, the advantage and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, it gets deep. So this is my first thought, right? Okay, so let's design a gun um, that the students would be able to modify and figure out, um, where basically uh, the gun has a uniform electric field. We charge our ink drop. Um, the ink drop is repelled from the negative side of the plate. It's attracted to the positive side of the plate, and that causes the, the, the shot of, of ink to, to exit the gun. Basically, that's all you really need to know for now. Okay, but in order to actually understand all of those elements, if we're starting from the very beginning of the electrostatic unit, well, there's a lot of variables here, right? Uh, my student doesn't know what charge is, right? They don't know what an electric field is. They don't know uh, basically anything. They know, <laughs> uh, true, uh, but, but the forces that go through, how this will be accelerating, um, we'll talk about, we want to talk about electric potential energy and all that jazz. Um, so we need to sort of scaffold out our unit with different experiences to get to the end goal of designing this gun, right? Okay. So the first thing that I ask them to do is, right, we want to find elementary charge. What is charge? How do I figure out, you know, how much charge is on an object? <clears throat> As it turns out, so, so what I did, I have a little bit of programming experience, just a tiny bit. Oh, oh, God. I don't know how to make that go away faster. Anybody? Left and right. <laughs> okay, here's the lore. It's a very rich lore. There we go. Okay. All right, so here's the first program that I created. This introduces our zap fish, uh, which is what actually holds charge. And uh, <laughs> you can rub the zap fish on the sweater and gain a little bit of charge. Um, it does not tell you how many electrons are being transferred, right? So they uh, wouldn't know that. But as you can see, we're gaining more and more charge every time we click on the zap fish. And basically what the students would do is rub the zap fish on the sweater a bunch of times. We collect all the data and we organize the data and we find out the charge is actually quantized, right? Um, and it, so it'll only go in increments of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 if they figure out, oh, hey, that must be the charge of the electron, right? And so we go from there. <clears> okay, <throat> right, so now we know a little bit more about charge. And now we start going into quests in Splatoon, right? 
um, they're going to engage in characters in the Splatoon universe, and one of the characters happens to be a uh, zapfish farmer who needs help corralling his zapfish. And uh, so they need to figure out, okay, what is the minimum size? Because this is not a very, you know, eco, ni nice, friendly farm. But they want to figure out the, the minimum size of the corral to hold the zapfish, right? And so now students need to start thinking about, okay, uh, as we push these zapfish together, if they have the same amount of the same type of charge, both negative, both positive, they're going to repel from one another, right? Um, and so what we need to think about is the closer that they get together, the more electrostatic force that they're going to experience, and it'll push more on the, the walls of the corral, right? So we need to find out a little bit about the materials that the corral is made of, how much force the corral can uh, withstand before we can decide how close to get them together. But before we do that, we need to basically derive and figure out, okay, how do I know what the electrostatic force is? How can I, you know, figure out that quantity, right? Uh, so I made another program <clears throat> to figure out electrostatic force, uh, where basically you can move them together, you can increase charges, you can, uh, I included mass, which actually has no effect whatsoever on the electrostatic force, but that's always fun to throw in something like that. Um, and you can see the force gets bigger as you get closer together, and so they can backtrack and figure out based on that data, they can derive the equation for electrostatic force. So they're figuring, they're the ones figuring it out. At no point am I giving them the equation. They are deriving it. Trust me, it, you can do it from, from this. I don't know. Uh, all right, so now they know a little bit about electrostatic force. They have an equation for electrostatic force. Now all of a sudden they can calculate and actually find out you know, the distance for the corral and, and solve that farmer's problem, right? That kind of makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, then finally, we know a little bit more about electrostatic force. Uh, now we can go back and talk to the main uh, ammunition expert in the Splatoon universe for the English, it's a whole story, uh, <coughs> and help them design their, their gun, right? <clears throat> okay, so if you don't know about uh, the Splatoon universe, basically what you want to do is uh, cover as much turf, they call them turf wars, as possible in ink. Um, so what the students will need to do is they're going to have to design their gun in such a way that it will you know, produce a nice ink splatter that will work for, for everybody involved. Um, in this process, they can also derive, sorry, it's kind of small, they can derive the equation for electrostatic force and electric potential energy for a charged particle in a uniform electric field as well. So they're deriving that equation. So <clears throat> let's just fire away, see what happens, okay? The, that's a fine splatter, but let's change some, some particles. Let's uh, make the particle mass really small. Let's increase the barrel length. I'm gonna move the nozzle position back a little. Let's increase the charge, let's increase the electric. Okay, all right, so we are, we're gonna get a particle it's very small that it's going to be moving very quickly when it exit the, exits the barrel of the gun. And that is the splat pattern that we get from that. So you can see it's a spread quite a bit, but because of the mass of the particle, uh, it's little, little tiny splatters, which is not great if you're trying to cover a large area of, the, of, of turf. Let's go sort of the other direction. All right, lots of particle mass. Uh, you can bring it right to the end of the barrel here. Uh, and we'll reduce the charged particle. Obviously, there's no gravity here also. That's kind of a, we could include ga gravity if we wanted, but to simplify things for my physics B students, we did not include gravity in this simulation. Uh, so obviously, <laughs> it's a little slow moving particle here that doesn't create a great, you know. So basically, you want a, a bigger uh, mass particle you know, we want them to have a decent amount of speed leaving the barrel. Um, so to do that, you know, we want to give it as much electric potential energy as possible, but with still a pretty large mass. <coughs> Excuse me. And we get a little bit better splat pattern. So you can, they can play with it and decide what splat pattern, you know, works best for them. Um, 
things that you could also include depending on your level of student. Um, you could talk about the material types, right? If it costs a lot of money to create a longer barrel, that might be something that you could weave into your class. Um, or if it costs a lot of money to increase the amount of charge on each ink droplet or, or whatever, the, you'll have to farm more uh, for zap fish, you know, is, the, is there an eco option that would be, you know, troubling for, I don't know, zap fish fanatics, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but you can see there's like a lot of wiggle room to do to tailor it kind of to your class. <clears throat> then if you wanted to, um, once they've created their gun, now you can introduce some of the problems of like, <clears throat> where should we put this gun? Um, how high up if we have, you know, how far will it launch? Like you need to know that information. Um, and so you can introduce some of the math at this point, right? With a gun that they've designed and equations that they have developed rather than just dropping in random math wherever, right? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So that is a little bit about uh, the project that I'm kind of working on. Um, <clears throat> we've got a little bit of time here. Um, you can ask me, uh, how, how is the implementation, Tori? How's it going in your classroom? Between, yeah, is that, is that a question? So I'm very interested in the presentation, but I'm curious about the implementation. So oh, thank you. Oh, excellent. Poorly. Uh, <laughs> turn, well, it turns out, like, this is my most recent unit. Um, I had COVID uh, for, like, two weeks of it, and then I had tonsillitis, and now I'm here. Um, so... It's been interesting. <laughs> Hasn't gone very smoothly, but I think if I were actually there in person, it would maybe be a little bit smoother. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I think. Um, but uh, I think there's some, some potential there and, and at least a sort of conversation of how we can implement some narrative design uh, in STEM classrooms. Um, about the what does the implementation mean? Yes, that's... That is totally modifiable per teacher and comfort level and students. For my classroom, it's in there. They have groups that they work in of about three students, and they stay in those groups for the entire unit so that they kind of work together. Um, and so they basically get a little narrative piece before each um, like challenge or each quest um, that introduces the problem that they're trying to solve. And then for my physics B students, uh, the lab that I actually hand out to them is a little bit more scaffolded. So there's places for um, like data tables and things. So they're kind of filling things up. But for a physics honors class, you could just say, here's the problem, here's the simulation, go. You know, and they can sort of um, design a little bit more of the experiment themselves. So it, it just kind of depends on your class. But for mine, it is a little bit more scaffolded for the students that I'm working with. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I think it's just the, the, the I think it would be rough either way had I just done regular stuff versus world building just because of the scenario that I was in. I didn't mean that necessarily that it was rougher than expected, but just because of my absence from the classroom, it's so exactly. You find that they're drawn into the story and the premise more than they would have been? Like if they're doing problems out of the textbook? Um, I think for most of them, yes. You have the few like naysayers, especially in a physics B classroom, it's already difficult to get buy-in from them. So you do have like the few holdouts that are like, you know, not as engaged with it, uh, but they're not going to be engaged anyway, probably. So you do your best and hopefully get more engagement with their group members and what's the engagement overall. Um, so yeah, I do think that I have a little bit more buy-in though with this, yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Sure. And the traditional kind of solving a problem, it's not really in school trying to. I wasn't engaged. And engage in these things because you know it's very abstract. Right. You know, I wasn't trying to, to kind of, you know, it didn't really. I wasn't seeing the end goal. Yes. You know, so, and that was that was the issue because it wasn't kind of contextual. Yes, exactly. Um, so if you kind of, I think what would might might be different is if you contextualize these. Things. So yes. If like. You know, you kind of say, okay, you guys kind of create this component. Yeah. You guys can create this component. Oh, kind of in which yes. this kind of happens. And I think maybe some kind of yes. you might have a Yeah, absolutely. Um and, and so that that's kind of <clears throat> the way that we're going with it is um, sometimes it's helpful to assign individual roles for each student so that they feel like they have a specific say for one thing. So, so one person might be, you know, the cost person, right, where they are in charge of analyzing the, the cost of building it and all that thing. Somebody else might be the materials person who is in charge of figuring out how difficult it is to obtain the materials and, and if it's eco-friendly or whatever, right? And so by adding roles to that, you can get additional buy-in. I didn't have it quite organized as well as that, but yeah, I think in the future, that's where I would kind of go with it. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. And that's kind of where we're going with it. I mean, even if you if you teach high school now, uh, if you're familiar with the next generation science standards, um, they encourage you to start each unit off with a phenomenon that you it basically creates the uh, the outline of a projects and like small mini projects throughout the way. And the end goal is to figure out, you know, the phenomenon that you introduced at the very beginning. And you do that through inquiry and different things. And you seemed yeah, familiar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, your, your experience with this reminds me a lot of my teaching in the student life in science class from a freshman science class, uh, the immune system using a, a game. Yes. And one of the things that I noticed, I want to know if you had a similar experience, was that when it broke down, which you better believe it did, it never broke down in the same way twice. Like, I would have one student over here who would just blaze through the game and mm. beat it, but have no idea why. So right. You have students who would be trying to treat it like it's a first person shooter, even though that just won't work. Right. And just, you know, I, I'm just flipping randomly on the screen. I don't get it. I don't like this. What, what kind of breakdowns have you witnessed? Not to like drag you through the mud. I mean, <laughs> no, you're, this is, this is the conversation that we need to have, I think. Yeah, how does it break? <clears throat> um, I, I definitely have those go getters of that, like finish the lab right away. Um, I didn't have as much just like random clicking because they did have a structured end goal for each simulation. So it wasn't so much um, that they don't really care about the game. Like they still have to get through the content to solve the problem. To, so like that wasn't as much of a breakdown for me. Um, but the pacing is definitely challenging. And the more open you make, your unit, the pacing becomes very problematic. My first idea when I was going to implement this was to like design out an entire website and then just like free for all, right? You guys go explore um, how whatever order that you want. Um, if you run into problems, you might have to backtrack and do a different quest first before moving on to the gun quest because you don't know anything about electrostatic force yet. Um, but I realized very quickly, especially for my physics B students, that that would be you know pretty utter chaos. With a higher level class, I think you would be able to give it a, a little bit more leeway with you know the the order that they want to do things and explore. But wrapping back to the question, I just sort of like talked myself into a corner there. I don't know. Um, what was it, just like some of the snafus that I wanted to... The, the, the individual 
Oh, yes. Okay. So, so then what, what I want to build in a little bit more and my idea for building in more about COVID and everything was for students that um, finish the activities faster to have additional narrative experience that isn't necessarily um, required. So like you finish your lab first. Awesome. Um, now, because you finished it early, you get a treat and you get to see a little bit more narrative you get a little bit more information maybe not everybody knows the cost of all the materials or they don't know the you know where the materials come from or whatever they get that little extra bit of experience so that when they make their lab report they can you know weave that in as well um so like sort of rewarding the students that finish quickly and well with a little bit more buy-in with the story right because the other issue with teaching science is i have so much content that I need to cover. I can't spend all of the time on narrative, right? But if I can weave in a little bit of extra narrative for those students that finish particularly quickly, I think that leads to more buy-in and that kind of thing and keeps them busy too, which is good. <laughs> it all sounds like like a very open setup where you can kind of go. And it's like, you know, if we talk in game terms, it's the difference between like Super Mario Brothers or the Legends of Zelda. Sure. Like it almost sounds like there's too much but if you divide it Levels. Yes, exactly. And depending if you have any sort of uh, familiarity with DMing, um, that type of thing, um, figuring out where to sort of put the railroads in, um, depending on the group that you're playing with, it can be very beneficial. If you want it to be completely open world and you have built out this whole, you know, uh, city, whatever, and you have it pictured in your mind that it's to the west, they decide they're going to go to the east, all of a sudden the city is like in the east, right? So you can kind of do those little tricks with your students to get them on the path that you want them to be on, right? And sort of railroad them in a little bit, but with the, they still think that they're the ones making the choices and they have the autonomy and yes. Yes. Love it. I think one of the biggest, like, that it's basically an educational game in a lot of ways. The emergent narrative of that game, how failures still are either almost rewarding or at least like funny sometimes, yes. is something that pushes someone to keep learning to actually get it correct. Yes. And I feel like that's something that situation or in any situation where a game for learning to try to make it so it has that potential to be like still fun or entertaining, even if you don't precisely get it correct. Yes. Um, yes. And and that's sort of the crux of the issue a little bit, because with science you do have to get it correct. Right? At the end of the day, that you have to solve a problem and you have to get the right answer, which is what makes the narrative design a little bit tricky. Right, because in the humanities or in in social studies or whatever, or in English, you can sort of stumble along the path and you're still experiencing the story. Right, I, I'm 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 looking at Trent over here because he's going to give a talk about world building that'll be a lot more coherent than what this is right now. And um, so shout out to Trent over there. Definitely go to that talk. Uh, what is five more minutes, please? Um, <clears throat> I had a slide, but um, I just wanted to say really quickly, the other thing for me that I found really helpful with this project was that, as I said, I'm not a super creative person. When I've DM'd in the past, I've used, you know, different shows and things that already have established stories and worlds um, because I, it, it's very overwhelming to me to like create an entire world from scratch. So by uh, using already established worlds that happen to match with some of the things that I've been talking about, um, in, in class, like that helped me design this out because I'm not the one that's creating the, you know, 100 years of turf wars and there's a, it's fascinating, I don't know. look at it, but um, I, I'm not the one that has to come up with that, but I'm just picking out the pieces and the, the characters that I want to incorporate in my story um, rather than designing them from scratch. So, yeah, I think that's about time. Any last minute questions? Yes. 
Um, I do think you want to have a pretty good match. Like you want to be in the world. You want the world to have something that the students should explore and they can only explore it if they understand the physics behind it. Right. So the Splatoon thing worked really well, right, because they already had built in all this stuff with electrostatic charge and uh, the ink gun matched really well to the inkjet printer. And so that the, it made the implementation a lot easier. If I just dropped them into Westeros, right, there's nothing in Westeros that screams electrostatic charge, right? So you, you do want to be careful about what you're selecting, what world you're using um, in your implementation for sure. I think that'll make it a lot smoother. And that was actually, had we had extra time, was my plan for like, okay, let's break into groups and discuss topics and what worlds would go well with what topics, but alas. Um, yeah. Was that, did that answer? But there was two questions. Sure. Yeah. That's that's probably what I would say for sure. Yeah. All right. I think that is session time, right? One forty-five. Did we didn't didn't want to go over? Yeah. All right. Excellent. That's it. Yeah.